Well, the video you just saw is our bishop of the Florida Conference, Bishop Ken Carter. He's also the president of the Council of Bishops of the United Methodist Church. Uh, and he had a vision that in the month of May, that all United Methodist churches in Florida uh, will participate in something he called an On Mission Together weekend, uh, where we would talk about missions and we would do missions as a congregation. So we set this week aside um, and hundreds of our members have participated in well over a dozen different projects serving our community. Some are projects we already do, like um, uh, uh, Sandwich Club on Wednesday or on Friday. We had our food distribution, food share, uh, and work through the week, Dine with Jesus on Monday. But then we did special projects yesterday, uh, ranging from gleaning cucumbers that will be part of our Dine with Jesus meal on Monday, uh, we made mats that are going to be given to the homeless and food packs that are going to be given to the homeless, uh, some encouragement bags for children that will be taking tests this week, a variety of things, some homes in the community that we were able to improve. Uh, your church was out there participating in this. And of course, this isn't new to us, is it? I mean, it's not, like, it's not like we don't know about service. This is a church that understands missions and service. Uh, just this year, in addition to the things we do on a weekly basis, uh, we've already sent a team to Puerto Rico. We've already sent a team uh, to Costa Rica. Uh, we have another team that's going to be going up into the panhandle uh, in the summer to do hurricane relief. We've been in Everglades City doing hurricane relief. There's plans for another Puerto Rico trip. Isn't that right, Steve? Uh, so this is a church that serves. This church knows about service. In fact, this is our 50th anniversary, so the GO team has planned that over the course of the year, we're going to do 50 different projects that benefit those in our community and uh, beyond in the greater world. Isn't that amazing? 50 different things. You give yourselves a round of applause. I think that's great. So we know this, uh, but I think this is a particularly interesting thing that we get to be part of, that it's not just us and our ongoing work, but we can know that, that there are United Methodist Christians all over Florida who are joining in that. And so it's not just here that, that hundreds of people have been in service and that thousands of people are benefiting, but, but across the state of Florida, thousands of United Methodists are involved in thousands of projects and thousands upon thousands of people are benefiting and the kingdom of God is advancing. I just think that's, I think that's a neat thing. It makes me proud to be a United Methodist. So I thought today uh, in our On Mission Together weekend, uh, we might just talk about why we do this. I mean, I think we know that, that, that it's important to do. We do it. We value it. But sometimes I think it's good to just step back and like, why is it that we as United Methodist Christians here at First Church, why do we think serving matters? Why be on mission together? And I'm, I want to say today that there's, there are really two reasons. There may be more than that, but I want to focus on two. And the first one is as simple as this, because the Bible tells us to. It is a core biblical teaching that God's people are supposed to care for the poor, the oppressed, the victimized, the voiceless, the weak, because God cares deeply. This is a core theme of Scripture. Uh, go back to the book of Exodus. You, you may remember last summer we studied the book of Exodus. As we begin Exodus, God's people are in Egypt as guests, but then become slaves. They're forced into terrible hardship. They, they are in their suffering, crying out to God. God hears them, and God sends Moses to deliver them. You remember the story, right? And he brings them out of slavery through the wilderness toward a promised land where they will become his people. But... Because they've been slaves for so many generations, he has to teach them, this is what it means to be my followers. You've been told by, how to live by Pharaoh and by slave masters. Now you need to learn how to be the people that I'm calling you to be. And so he starts to give them instructions. Ten Commandments are part of that instruction. But then in Exodus chapter 22, we see more of these instructions. Listen to this. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. For you are foreigners in Egypt. In essence, you, we just got treated pretty badly, didn't we? We're not going to act like that. that that's not going to be becoming for us. Do not take advantage of the widow 
or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. Hint, hint, just like I heard your suffering and cry when you called out to me. I'll hear theirs. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. Do you think God is serious about this? Hmm. And then he goes on. If you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal. That's not how we're supposed to be involved in helping people. Charge no interest. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge or collateral, basically, return it by sunset because the cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? When they cry out to me, I will hear, for I am what? Now here's a clue, folks. Anytime God says, this is who I am, in it is implied, you should be that too. Right? If God says, I am compassionate, that means if you follow me, you're to be compassionate. If God is generous, we're to be generous. If God is kind and caring, we're to be kind and caring. If God is just, we're to be just. If God is love, we're to be love. Find an exception in Scripture. You won't. So just take my word for it. It's true. I mean, whatever God says I am, He intends for us to be. But notice here, in this, in this founding sort of principle, God is saying, I care about people who are vulnerable. Widows, orphans, someone in need of money, people who are vulnerable, potentially cold, potentially hungry, somebody that has a need, someone who's going to cry out in pain when they're hurt. I care about that. And oftentimes, in history and today, it's the weakest members of society that are often exploited. It's the weakest members of society that are exploited, and God says, I won't stand for it. It's when people are in places they can be easily victimized, God says, don't do that. <laughs> I expect more from you. And the expectation is not just don't do it, but do something about it. When you see someone who is hungry, tired, weak, in prison, do something about it. Come to their aid. Now, how important is this? How significant is it? Well, just interestingly, I just read to you Exodus 22, 21 through 27. If we backed up one verse, Exodus 20 says, whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord must be what? <laughs> That's idolatry, right? God take idolatry seriously? Yeah, we all know that. Don't worship idols. Now notice what he says at the other end, 28, do not blaspheme God. Would we agree with that? that don't, don't do that. Don't worship idols. Don't blaspheme God. He bookends this passage with that. And we're like, oh, I get that. Don't worship idols. And, and that's the one unforgivable sin, Jesus said, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I won't do that either. And then right in the middle, take care of the poor. Take care of the poor. It shows where God places the importance of this. If you're going to call yourself my people, then you care about those in society that are most vulnerable. Take a look at Psalm 146, verses 7 through 9. I read it just a moment ago. God upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The, the, those are those who act rightly, the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. And when the Bible talks about the wicked, most often it's those who practice in unjust ways. The wicked are those who take advantage of the poor. You don't want to be one of those. Now, this is a primary theme through Scripture. Here we see it in the founding documents of Israel, the law. But it gets continued in the prophet. The primary reason that God's so angry in the prophets is that they're not taking care of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the alien. The primary reason. Then Jesus comes on the scene. And think about how much time Jesus spent with those who were suffering. Right? Those who were in need. 
It, it's demonstrated throughout. We see it in the early church, right? They, they, they care for the widow and the orphan among them. Now, now notice in this passage I just read to you from Psalm, um, Psalm 146, that, that there are specific categories of people mentioned. It talks about prisoners. Now, now we think of prisoners today as people who've committed crimes against society. But oftentimes in biblical times, the, the person in prison was because of debt. And why would you go in debt? Maybe because you had a bad crop. Maybe because there was a famine. Maybe because uh, there, there was something that went wrong in your business practice. It wasn't that you were a bad person to be put away. It was just how they handled debtors. Uh, it says he gives sight to the blind. If, if, one, if a person in biblical times was deaf or blind or, or physically limited in some way or a, a leper, that meant they couldn't be uh, income-earning people in society and thus would be very poor. He talks about the foreigner among you. Why does that matter? Because the foreigner among them, someone that came from another society culture, wouldn't own property or a business among them. The orphan, without a family to care for them, without inheritance. Widows. It, it was in biblical times in Jewish society, women didn't own property. They didn't own business. And so if they didn't have family to care for them, they would basically be out on the street with no means of support. God says these are the most vulnerable. Widows, orphans, foreigners, those in prison, those who have physical illnesses. And we might have different categories today. I mean, we might add the homeless. We might, we might add people who battle addiction. We might, we, we might add people who are caught up in the whole immigration system. We, we, might, we might add people who are uh, just living in uh, crippling poverty. We might add uh, people who are in our country who are still struggling around the issues of, of racism. Uh, we, on and on. Uh, the abused. On and on and on. We might add different categories. What, what's important is that God cares about those who are weak and voiceless, and who on their own cannot find the advantages in the world that so many of us have just inherited. There are certain privileges I have as a white male in this country that I did not earn. I was just born into this reality. And thus as a person, as a follower of God, I'm called to do something with that, that privilege for the sake of others. Poverty, oppression, justice. These are biblical principles. If we call ourselves Christians, if we, call, if we say that we believe in the authority of Scripture, then we have to take this theme very seriously. James 1.27 says, religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless. Would you like to participate in religion that is pure and faultless in the eyes of God? Right? Look after widows and orphans in their distress. And keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I actually like the New Living Translation version a little better. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. It makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? This week I'm reading a book called uh, um, Walking in Wonder by John O'Donohue, who's a Celtic Christian author. And he writes this, Who are the people in our society that we never see? Who are the absent ones that we never hear from? There are many of them, and when you start thinking about it, they are usually the poor and the vulnerable. We have no idea, most of us who are privileged, of the conditions in which so many poor and underprivileged people actually live. So these people are absent, and they are deliberately kept out because their voices are awkward, they're uncomfortable. And they make us feel uneasy. That's the reality of it. How many poor people do you know? How many poor people do you know? How many of you have raised a teenager at some point in your life? Right? Okay. So just want to check this. Uh, have you ever been told by your... Have you ever said to your teenager... Do as I say, not as I do. 
right? We're all guilty of that. I've said it, right? In one, no, so many words. Because teenagers can point out our hypocrisy, right? We do our very best as parents to raise our children to the highest possible standard, teach them good morals, like this isn't okay, that's okay, and then a word slips out, right? Or, or so, like, you said... Right, you, they're teenagers. I see all the nodding. Right, teenage. We, we probably did it as teenagers too to our parents. Like you said, teenagers point out your hypocrisy. Right, right. We're all doing the best we can. We all did the best we could as parents. I think, uh, but 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 you know, at some point we. That's the implication. You know, okay, I'm not perfect, but do as I say, not as I do. <clears throat> there is someone. There is a parent though that will never say that. God. Consistently in Scripture, there is nothing that God tells us to do that God doesn't first do God's self, right? There is nothing that God expects of us that God doesn't expect of himself, right? God, God does this. In fact, there's the word, does. It's action. So go back to Psalm 146, 7 and 9. I just want you to notice the action words of God. God doesn't say, care for the poor, care for the widow, care for the homeless, without saying that God will do it himself. Notice this, verse 7. God upholds the cause of the oppressed. God gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner, sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. You see the action in that? Well, you might think, well, how does God do that? I've never seen God do that. How does, that, how does God carry that out? Well, first he did it in Jesus, right? I mean, this is the life that Jesus lived. He came to us through a poor family. He lived among poor people, the poorest in society. During his public ministry, he was a homeless man. Did you know that? You worship a homeless Savior? He said, birds have nests and foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Completely dependent on the care of others. Completely. He didn't earn money once he began his ministry. He was completely supported by others. He began his ministry in a sermon in his own home church. He said, I am here today to tell you that this is the year of the Lord's favor, to to set free the captives, to, to bring sight to the blind. I mean, that was his defining moment. This is what my ministry is going to be. And he went and healed the sick. He went and drove demons out of people who are spiritually oppressed. He fed the hungry. He gave dignity to those that society said had no dignity. He surrounded himself with the poorest of the poor. Think about the 12 disciples. Those were not impressive folk. <laughs> one, was a, one was a terrorist. That's what zealots were. They were terrorists. One was a tax collector. Everybody hated tax collectors. Some of them were, four of them were fishermen. Fishermen it was like the lowest of working class. These were not educated. They weren't people of means. They weren't people of wealth. He he surrounded himself with common people and taught them how to serve. And then the night before he died for us, when they got together to celebrate the Last Supper, right? The Lord's Supper, the Passover meal. Everybody's sitting down. Everybody's ready to eat. Jesus takes off his robe, puts a, a towel around his waist, gets a bowl of water, and he gets down on his hands and knees, and he takes each and one of their dirty, stinky feet in his hands, and he washes them. And that's the job of a servant. That's not the job of the rabbi. It's not the job of the master. The night before he was nailed to a cross for the salvation of the world, he was down on his hands and knees washing dirty, nasty men's feet. Men's dirty, nasty feet. I didn't mean the men were dirty and nasty. I meant. <laughs> Including Peter, who was about to deny him. Including Judas, who had already betrayed him. He was washed the feet of his betrayer, and the rest who all were about to abandon him. He got down on his hands and knees. He washed their feet one by one. And then he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. I mean, those are titles of respect, right? Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Did you hear it? I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done. Do you think he was only talking about washing feet? That we should just wash feet more often? That would be fine. That would be fine. 
Maybe he did mean for us to wash each other's feet more often. It's a humbling thing to do. It's a spiritual thing to do. I think it was a metaphor, though. Serve each other. As I have done for you, as I have come down from my high position and knelt before you, do that. Serve one another. It's not beneath you. And then listen to what he says. For truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be, excuse me? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if, it's contingent. You'll be blessed if you do them. Now, let's just talk for a moment about how countercultural that is. For, for every one of those disciples, I guarantee their thought would, would be, sure would be nice if there was a servant around here to come wash my feet. Right? Sure would be nice to have someone serve me. That's what blessing is, right? I can kick back and have everybody take care of me. That's what blessing is, right? Would be, sure would be nice to be blessed. Somebody come bless me. Jesus says, you want to be blessed? Wash a dirty foot. See how he turns that around? Right? You want to live a blessed life? You got to be like Jesus. You want a blessed life? You can't just take the, the advantages of Jesus. You know, he died on my cross. And I'm, saved, I'm saved forever, right? You know, I'm blessed. Right? Too blessed to stress. <laughs> Too blessed to obsess. I mean, whatever. I don't know what it is, right? I mean, what greater act of service than Jesus dying on the cross? Right? And he says, if you want to be my follower, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. He completely turns around. What is blessing? Remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are you who grieve. Blessed are you who hunger now. Blessed are you when people say all kinds of evil things about you. Right? He turns blessing all upside down. This world tells you you're blessed when you, you can kick back and take it easy and let others take care of you. Jesus says, you want a really blessed life in my kingdom? You serve. You serve. That's where the blessing is found. That's where the blessing is found. I asked you a moment ago uh, if you know any poor people. Uh, Oscar Romero is one of my heroes. He was the Archbishop of El Salvador. Uh, he was martyred um, by the government because he took the side of the poor, uh, not the side of the government. Recently, St. Pran uh, Francis, Pope Francis made him a saint, St. Oscar Romero. He said this, there is a criteria for knowing whether God is close to us or far away. Do you want to be close to God? Right? Here's, the, here's how you know, according to Oscar Romero. All those who worry about the hungry, the naked, the poor, the disappeared, the tortured, the imprisoned, about any suffering human being, they are close to God. You want to find God? Serve someone. Serve someone who's less advantaged than you less privileged than you, that has a greater need than you, someone who's hurting, someone who's suffering, someone who's struggling, someone whose society is holding down, serve them, and there you'll find the heart of God. So I want to end with this. Um, I've been asked a lot the question, hey, what's next for First Church? People were asking me that before they knew about the, the change in, in pastors, uh, but I've heard it since too. Hey, what's the new pastor's plans? The new pastor plans to move in, <laughs> to, 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 to put their kids in school. I, a new pastor doesn't have a plan yet. Come on. Right? What's next? I hear it a lot about, you know, we, we have this food ministry that's, that's coming to an end, food share. Um, and, and there's a concern, like, well, isn't there a need in our community to feed people, but we're not going to do that? There's a concern about that. That's a good concern. Edible Extras, who's, who's made that food possible, is coming to an end. People are like, so what's next? Like, what are we going to do? Like, there's people that have need out there. What are we going to do? And implicit in the question is, pastor, what are we going to do? What are the church leaders going to do? What, what plans are the committees making? Or there's a new pastor coming. What, what, is, what is she going to have us do? I, I want to remind you that every ministry of significance in this church that I can think of, and I'm sure someone's got an exception, didn't come from a pastor. 
didn't come from a committee. Now, church council may have said, yes, we support that. We'll, we'll, we'll get behind you. But uh, I, they all, from Bethlehem Revisited to Food Share to Dine with Jesus and on and on and on. Ken Beers in there. Am I right, Ken? It all started in people like Ken Beers or Pat Beers or, or Michelle Musselman or, or many, many, many other members of this church that saw a need in the community and saw a gift within our church and said, we got to do something. It started a person in this church who said, I feel like God is saying we need to, right? And came forward, had the courage to come forward. We call that a calling. Had the courage to come forward. And so here's what I very strongly am going to ask you to do. When Pastor Vidalis comes, do not go to her and say, uh, what's your vision? What's your plan? When you all asked me that, do you remember what I said? I'm still looking for a dentist. <laughs> I, you know, you're new. I, you don't have a vision. We're new, right? What I do encourage you to do, what a blessing it will be, is if you go to the new pastor and say, I've been praying about what's next for our church. I've been praying about the needs of our community. I've been, I've been praying that God would tell me how God wants to use me, and I'm feeling a calling that maybe our church could get involved in this. And I want to offer that, Pastor. Would that be okay? Do you see the difference? One is kind of passively waiting until it comes down from on high. It doesn't work like that, friends. It never has worked like that in the church. It comes from you. Because this is us. We're the body of Christ. And God works in people in surprising ways. It just may be that the, the greatest thing this church has ever done is sitting in the heart of somebody in this room. And the question is, are you going to let it bubble up? Are you going to listen to God call you? Are you going to be brave and courageous and say, I think God is saying, let's do this, and I'm, I'm it. That God's breaking my heart for something that breaks his. The next thing is sitting in one of your hearts right now. Will you let it come forward? Let's pray. And so God, we thank you that you are a God whose heart breaks for suffering. We thank you that you're a God who doesn't just sit back and and wait for somebody else to do it, but that you came in Jesus to put your love into action and to show us how. And God, we thank you that you invite us to be part of what you're doing in your kingdom. I pray, Lord, for what's next for this church, that, that you would begin to speak, maybe even in these moments. Somebody maybe just felt your, your tug on their heart to do something for your kingdom in this place. I pray you won't let them off the hook too easily, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.